Hello, and you are very welcome to episode 197 of the Game Pit Podcast, a podcast about modern tabletop gaming. My name is Ronan, and joining me this time around is a guest from a long, long, long time ago. Talks about role playing games. The most beautiful man in gaming, Adam. (laughs) You're very welcome to the Game Pit, Adam. Thank you very much. It's a a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad it's an audio only medium. <laughs> and yeah, so, I can see. So people you. will believe you. It'll be fine. <laughs> he is gorgeous. Don't have it. It's false modesty. <laughs> Last time you were on, possibly we were in a studio in central London talking about role playing games. I think that was the last time. Yeah. Seven years, maybe six oh, years. Oh, it's it's a good long while ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely at least at least six or seven. So that was, I think we we'd sort of been playing some Dungeons and Dragons, and I was maybe running a fake campaign. Yeah, there was a Star Wars going on, I think. Oh, oh, there was. That was getting discussed this last weekend with Lloyd, the other person who's been a guest on recently, about yeah. blue milk being made. and That's it's all anybody ever remembers from, from Star, Star Wars. That's, the that's, blue milk. You've got to hit that in the role-playing game, otherwise what's the point? <laughs> so what have you played in the last seven years, Adam? Go. Wow. Uh, Well, I mean, still quite a lot of Dungeons & Dragons. So I've moved um, out of London. I've fled from you. Specifically? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Just your your presence was uh, was making London intolerable. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's not a lot of love. (laughs) I'm now living near Bristol uh, in, in Gloucestershire, having moved here and been somewhat trepidatious moving away from London moving away from sort of known gamers so there was a, a group in Bristol where I work with Martin possibly friend of the of the podcast possibly foe of the podcast <laughs> if, he's, if he's ever been on but <laughs> foe in person um, <laughs> Martin I don't think Martin's ever been on but yes, Martin is an also sort of person from London on board who who ran it for a while and is a friend of ours for a very long time. Martin Griffiths, he's well known on BGG. And uh, the reason he's never been on the podcast is because he analyses games far too smartly. <laughs> and I can't follow most of his posts when he starts getting things. Especially on like that, was it the Meatball Guild or something that he's part of? Where they oh, really... yes. I have looked at that occasionally and, and very much the same thought. I, <laughs> I'm sure you're all absolutely right. Yeah, but I, could be. I don't know. Could be. Have you got a kids section? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've gone out. You've gone out of London. You found a couple of new groups of gamers. Yeah, found a group with him in Bristol, but then in my local Enverons, various groups actually. We sort of got a, a couple going. One of them in the local brewery, which is fantastic, genuinely. <laughs> and it's it's given me a chance to play a real mix of games because with Martin's groups, there's a lot more. Older games, a lot of things that kind of come back around and often sort of slightly, not necessarily lighter, but shorter games will get played more. And then my other games here, there is a bit more culture than new and definitely more of a, a lean towards we are playing a game this evening. There will be a kind of centrepiece game, so longer, slightly heavier games. So it's it's allowed for a, a really good variety and also a new Dungeons & Dragons group. So couldn't be better. Good, you're so happy you've moved away from me. Would your <laughs> preference be towards that play in multiple shorter games or having a set-piece game, or is does the mix suit you? The mix suits me to an extent. I definitely enjoy both. I think, given the choice, I'd lean slightly more towards more of the multiple smaller games. I like a heavy game now and then, but if I've got three hours of an evening... Actually, I'd quite like to sit down and play three or four different card games, a bit of variety, maybe sort of move around groups and and just a bit more of a range. You can call them card games. I'll call them bullshit Adam games. I mean, it's different (laughs) names for the same sort of thing. I I haven't even mentioned Juddick yet. (laughs) (laughs) Adam's a Juddick fan. I mean, 10 of you are going to love that and the rest of you are going to be like, right, episode gone nothing he says is valid <laughs> yeah just that's it turn off now no I've, I've made some converts I've, I've got some people playing innovation even Matainai clearly that's the quality of gamers in this area Matainai is perfectly fine <laughs> it is innovation excellent. is awful okay <laughs> <laughs> so having a, a bit of a background about you we're going to learn more I've got some probing stripping questions to come up I'm going to throw them at you when you least expected alright well I am entirely unprepared 
<laughs> a game from last year that was being talked about around me, and Sean had played it, and then you came down to ours a couple of weeks ago, and you had played it as well, is Acropolis from yeah. Gigamic and Jules Messo. It is a tile drafting game in which there is a row of tiles out. The first one in the row is free, and then if you wish to take any more, you have to pay one per tile that you skip, although they don't gather on the tiles, Adam. Just clarifying that for you. They do not. They go to the bank. Okay, good. No (laughs) rules errors in that first game. Good. (laughs) (laughs) And then these tiles have got three hexes on them each, and they have got various things. They might have marble quarries in which you'll be able to get more stones when you cover over the quarries they might have different colors of tiles but also the same colors but with stars on them and what you're trying to do is collect stars of a color and then collect also spaces of the same color so for example you might collect lots of purples and lots of purple stars and they're going to multiply together at the end of the game and give you your score in purple and there are various colors and the various colors wish to be spatially in slightly different circumstances so the reds are barracks and they like to be around the outside of your own little hex thing that you're building up and the purples we discussed are temples they like to be completely surrounded there are yellow shops that don't want to be adjacent to any other shops there's blue housing that wants to be adjacent to other blues in a big contiguous contiguous group and there's green parks that don't care where they are So you're being pulled in slightly different directions as to where you wish these colours to go. I mentioned covering over the quarries to get yourself more stones, to give yourself more flexibilities for the drafts they come round to you, because you can build on top. Once you've built that first layer, you can go on top with other tiles. When, Like I say, you cover quarries, you get stones. But also the level of where the, not the stars, but the the actual scoring colours are, adds to it. So a level one purple temple let's say if you had four stars out would score you four points if you got it to level two it would score you eight points if you got it to level three it would score 12 points and there's a pull towards specializing in what you're doing because getting those far up can be very good and also of course the fact that everyone else is aware that you've built your purples or reds whatever might be very high up and they're going to attempt to prevent you from getting the stars which are like the lifeblood of your scoring I'm pretending there that there might be some interaction within the drafting of the game, Adam, but it was just a pretense. <laughs> to an extent, it's it's maybe going to depend on how many times you've played it previously and the various experience, and particularly if you've played it and you've seen somebody really focus and concentrate on one thing and absolutely run away with it, then I, I think that will, on the second play, lead you to be a little bit more tactical in the drafting. I think... It's an issue of really any drafting game of this type. The incentive to stop somebody else is always going to be less than the incentive to benefit yourself. So it really has to be a situation where you can do both. Or maybe, you know, okay, there's there's one here and it's free and I'd get some benefit from that. If I pay two blocks, I can get one that's a little bit further down... I get the same benefits and I'm stopping you from getting it. There's a a degree of chance as to how frequently those situations are going to come up and it's probably not that often. So yeah, there's definitely a a slight solitaire-ish element to it. I think compared to some other sort of open drafting games that I've played recently, and I think you've, you've previously talked about Village Rails... Mm -hmm. where this was really an issue that even to engage on that level, you'd need to have a very clear idea of what everybody else is doing. And with some games, it's quite difficult. I think it is a strength of Acropolis that it's so visual. All you need to do is glance across at somebody else's tableau and just see, okay, you've got a big sprawl of that colour. Particularly, you've got those colours higher up. It is really simple, really quick to see what somebody wants so at least it's easier to engage in that than it is with some other games it goes through the whole production quality though as well the graphic design is very clear it's a simple system but given it's a very reasonably priced the production quality is high and it's a pleasant experience to play with those pieces it is they're nice thick tiles which obviously you really need when you're doing that stacking when you've got multiple levels And yeah, I think it's sort of the right level of abstraction, that if you look at the tiles, there is some artwork on it. It's quite simple, but it's quite nice. Well, there's there's some little tiny houses. You maybe get the sense that you are building a city. It didn't feel to me like a completely abstract game, but it was sufficiently abstracted that it's very visually clear. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, the attempt at calling them barracks. Barracks go around the edge, do they? Do yeah, they? I, I mean, now I can think about it, I am remembering the, the scoring multipliers, which are just big circles with a star in them. Yeah. So, I get the thing. so, so yeah, no worries, it's an abstract. But it's, it's a, a clear and nicely drawn abstract. It's very gentle. It is. And it introduces some concepts, I think, that are developed into... And you would recognise from having played this if it was one of your earliest games into other sort of heavier titles. It's it, it's got building blocks of design that we are just so used to that perhaps we don't appreciate the fact that they are the building blocks and they're the things you have to learn you know, as you're coming in. For the production quality, for the cleanliness of the rules, the graphic design, it's a good game. It, it, it's built well. It works. You're making yeah. decisions. You feel like you can be smart and clever and set yourself up to go up. I know some people don't like the name Gateway Game, but it is almost a perfect gateway game. It is, and I suppose the obvious comparison, because of the layering of it, because of the vertical stacking, is Tuluva. But Tuluva is mean and horrible and it breaks my brain. <laughs> well, I think that's it. So it's it's Tuluva for if you've got a headache and you're not, <laughs> you're not really up for that, that degree. It has that same physicality, and I think some of the same decisions, because it has that same rule that you can't completely cover a tile mm. in the exact same shape. So you are having to plan and to think, okay, will I be able to build up from here? The way that the quarries work, I think, is really nice, that you're having to say, okay, here's a point from which I can build up, and if I can get my quarries in there as well, which are a resource but also a points at the end if you've got them left over. So I think that element of it works well, you know, I think the comparison to Tuluva isn't only superficial. Oh, no, yeah, definitely. Mechanically, you can see how it builds on it. So Tuluva is much more difficult to be successful in. In Acropolis, yeah. I think you, you can feel like, you know, the first time you put three quarries together and build on top of them and go, oh, I've got three stones in one go. It gives you the, the constant sort of hits of oh, a little bit of success, a little bit of success. Whereas, to me, I'm just bad at Tuluva. <laughs> Just... Yeah, I've never done well at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, overall final thoughts on Acropolis for you? It's a very pleasant filler. It does what it does well. It's, as you said, visually it's very well designed. And if you just want end of the evening, you're all a bit tired or just waiting for somebody to arrive, it's nice and quick and not without thought. There are definitely decisions to be made in the drafting and in the positioning. So enjoyable, but lightweight. I have nothing more to add. I can't believe we agreed so much on the first game. There's no way this is going to continue. Not Surely not. So, um, Lloyd and I discussed Ahoy a few weeks ago from Lather Games, Greg Loring Albright. And I wanted to bring you in because you are our Ahoy expert, as well as looking like a beautiful pirate. <laughs> you also have played Ahoy more than both of us combined, probably. I was honestly enraged when I, I heard that episode. I thought, how are they talking about it? I introduced them both to this game. And <laughs> <laughs> they're going to cover it without me. Let loose your passions, Adam. <laughs> Give us your thoughts on Ahoy. I was really drawn to Ahoy because I'm... I suppose I'd say I'm a fan of later games. I'm a fan of Cole Worley games, is the main thing. So I've played a lot of Root, which is one of those games that never really took off at London on board but it's something we play a lot with the, the brewery group here. So I played quite a lot of that recently and really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I would say I really enjoyed Oath. It's an unusual one and you need the right group and you need the right time. But but we, you know, I think we got about 10 games out of it and there's, there's really something there. Is that with the same group? With the same group you're getting together and playing it again week after week after week? It was, yeah. yeah. And I think you really need that for Oath because it's not an obvious legacy game. The legacy elements are more subtle. And so to get to the point where you're thinking, oh, maybe I can't win this time, but if I engineer things, if I move things around slightly, that could set me up for the next game. That takes a good few plays to get to the point where you're able to, to think like that. And so it's great if you've got that time. Did it still feel satisfying to make those decisions, though, whereby I'm not actually really relevant to this game? Was it enough, because it's quite a long per play, to set it up for next time and be like, oh, but this will come to fruition in five hours' time? I think so, because you're sort of in the position where you're you're thinking, I'm probably not going to win this one, so let's let's look at next time. But you never know. There's always the possibility. And you're certainly still engaged. There are still interesting things that you can do to affect your position in the game, even if you're playing for second. So, 
I enjoyed it. It did fall out of rotation because it needs that level of commitment and, yeah. and you're not going to sustain that long term, I don't think. So for all of those reasons, I had kind of seen Ahoy. I quite like the theme as well. I like the artwork. It's Kyle Fair in Art who does uh, a lot of the, the artwork for later games and I really like that. I quite like a nautical theme. So as soon as I saw this game, everything about it made me think, yeah, I'm going to give that a go. It's billed as a two to four player game. And I think possibly a thing that you did cover last time round is realistically, it's a three player game. I've not tried it at other player counts, I have to admit. That's an echo chamber you've built for yourself there, little uh... I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm insisting upon this and, and therefore else. never seeing anything. <laughs> My reasoning is at, at two players, I think you lose a fun element of the game. And so it becomes a much more just straight back and forth area control without the smugglers doing their interesting bits. At three players, we have in most games almost entirely gone through the deck of cards because the smuggler interacts with the cards so much. And I've seen comments online, and I'm sure it's the case, that in a four-player game with two smugglers, you would run out of those cards maybe two-thirds of the way into the game and then it becomes a lot less interesting for those two players. So for those reasons, genuinely, I do think it's a, a three-player game. I think I've played it five times now. Because of that specificity, it's not been as easy to get back to the table. But I think as an asymmetric game, it's really well balanced. I've seen every faction do well. I've also seen different factions try different tactics. So there is an element to which you're led towards one path of success for each of the factions, but it's not on rails. Yeah, I just think if you've got the right number of players, it's not a long game. It's only an hour, maybe 90 minutes at most. It's just a really enjoyable, maybe kind of, again, we don't like Gateway, but a kind of introduction to asymmetric games. You're talking about the, the online comments for it. There's definitely something that comes up. Given we talk about Acropolis, the, the random element was very limited in Acropolis. It is the draw of a tile sometimes of where they are in placement. In Ahoy, there's a lot of moving parts with regards to uh, you've got cards coming out of various decks, the way the islands get set up, as we saw in our game, how interactive the smuggler can be. Because if the cards come out and they're where there's strongholds going on and where there's lots of action, they have to avoid that. There's also the rolling of the dice. You know that Lloyd and I did that whole commentary and no one's noticed. We never mentioned dice in the game at all. <laughs> so we yeah, can definitely talk dice about Dice allocation that. game. I had a thoughts that if everyone had played multiple times, because it does feel balanced, because then I think there would be depth to it because you're reacting to everything that people are doing, would the random start to take over more or would you at least feel it more because you know the structures of the game better? I can certainly see how it would, Yes. It's primarily input randomness. It's the kind of randomness that I enjoy, because I like a tactical game more than a strategic game. With the dice allocation, you roll them, and then you're having to say, OK, how do I make the most out of what I've got? And there are resources that you can spend to, to adjust your dice and to slightly mitigate that. And I can absolutely see that if you're really well matched and the factions are really well matched, then somebody on several turns happening to roll the results that they need and that could be enough to to make the game for you that i think is is less frustrating and is just the nature of the game and you see that happen for someone you think well maybe on my turn maybe it comes up and i, I get what i'm after the one that i can see is frustrating is the randomness with which the islands come out and i definitely understand that as the smuggler if they are all spread out wrong or if in the early game you're only seeing cards of tiles that haven't come out yet you can control that to an extent because obviously then you make sure you're the one exploring and at least deciding where they go but it's not the case that you're drawing multiple tiles and choosing what goes down it's just here's what i got and i'm, I'm choosing where it goes it speaks to the the sort of interaction between the factions though that if the smuggler's exploring more that plays into the mollusk sands more absolutely and yeah. then can the sharks make a comeback from that because the more territory that's in play the easier it is for the mollusk it felt like that is the case, and actually in most of the games, ultimately, all of the territory came out, and I think the only game where it didn't, the Mollusks, didn't really stand a chance. Mm. 
But then if things are coming out faster, then potentially there's a benefit to the sharks because they've got a bit more time to kind of build up strongholds in important areas to identify, well, certainly for one thing, now we know which of the islands isn't in play. So I know for a fact smugglers going to have to come to this one if ever they need to deliver that type. But you want the smugglers to come. Because exactly. they're giving you points, yeah. I, I think it's an interesting thing with the timing of the sharks off... They kind of almost have to just cruise around, nip in at the heels, and then wait for certain islands to become more valuable, and then go, whoomp, that's mine. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose when I say stronghold, I mean kind of in the broadest sense of here's a concentration of my forces. Yeah, yeah. We've both just done that. <laughs> they do also have the actual the pieces, which are a stronghold. And I think that's a really interesting aspect of it, because essentially, once you put a stronghold in, it becomes easier to hang on to that area, but the smuggler can't visit it anymore. And so it can never go up in value. So you're really kind of absolutely going all in and saying, I think this is as good as it's going to get, and now I'm grabbing it. In some ways, it might be that it's a a game that actually doesn't bear so many repeated plays. In a way, it's the opposite of Oath, that maybe if you have the same group who play it repeatedly, then you will see certain dominant strategies develop. You will see luck having absolutely more to do with it. So it might actually be one that's just because it's so easy to teach that is fun to just be able to bring out and say, great, we've got an hour, we happen to have three people, let's check this out and have a quick game. And I think if you accord it that level of of kind of significance, I guess, then it's perfect. And the fact that maybe there is luck involved and and somebody might be scuppered from very early on hopefully isn't as much of an issue. Which, funnily enough, works best with a group that have played it many times because you see the luck even out over a roll. It's it's almost like a counterbalance to that. So I suppose that's the other side, yeah, that at least you see see the luck spread around, yeah. So possibly leaving a slightly bigger gap between plays than other sort of asymmetric games but having it one that lasts over a long time so thereby you come back to it going I remember that game of it remember this game of it and what have you yeah absolutely I think a lot of games would benefit from that now that was the first of four games in a row that have dice involved in them I just so I always associate you with having a, a die in your pocket um hang on yep guaranteed yep yep <laughs> I do I also have an enormous tray of dice that you may be able to hear I can certainly hear it on my desk <laughs> which is which for any all. particular reason you just like rolling them because they had to go somewhere and uh, it's just yeah something to play with while I'm bored at work essentially <laughs> fair enough fair <laughs> enough you did design the odd game or two I did. So I guess I was really influenced when I started gaming. I played Alien Frontiers. And I think it was one of those games that is, you know, is a great game. It's a lot of fun. But also really sort of opened up the idea of, oh, okay, if you can do these things with the dice. And it was particularly, I think, the the cards. Having the powers in Alien Frontiers and being able to, to move dice around, that really clicked for me. And that was something I really enjoyed and that, that then I wanted to kind of keep coming back to that through playing lots of dice games and, and also, as you say, through designing some not fantastically received games. <laughs> <laughs> but you always seem to be interested to me in what... I mean, I, I know this is an aspect of many games, but what you can do with dice and what you can do with cards. Yeah. And sometimes it seems like if it's an interesting twist your brain seems to start sort of pinging off it and going, oh, you could do that, that could affect this, that could affect that. And you want, is your request now, I usually I'm the person trying to get people to talk about it, but you wanted to talk about Rumble Nation. I did, I did. So this is a game that I played. I think I'd heard you talking about it, but it wasn't quite enough to get it on my radar. Not for anyone in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> I played it with, with the Bristol group and loved it and immediately thought, okay, how do I get hold of it? Martin was actually able to track down a copy from Japan, so I got a copy that came directly from Japan, introduced it to the group here in Stroud, and immediately at least two of those people went out looking for copies, which actually came from Italy, because one of the guys is Italian, and he was like, oh, brilliant, it's, it's available, I'm going back home. Honestly, it sort of feels like, you know, the, the kind of the first Sex Pistols gig, that they reckon they were like... <laughs> 40 people at it, but then half of them went and formed their own punk bands. Yeah. <laughs> Rumble Nation feels like that for me, that anybody who plays it goes, oh, yeah, I've got to have that. Because it's so immediate to grok. When you roll three dice, you've got a re-roll, which gives you some interesting decisions of, okay, this is all right for me. 
Can I push it? Can I make it better? And enough choice once you've rolled your three, unless they all come up the same number, of how you split it as well. So there's enough going on to really give you some thinking, but it is driven by chance. And it's the right kind of pacing for a game that is is luck-driven. It's got the cards as well that gives you that one turn where you can think, you know what, there's something I have to do, so I'm not going to rely on chance. I'm just going to go for the card. And then the scoring is so clever. That decision of I go for low-value stuff and I just hope that I can form a chain of backup that nobody is able to break and get to everywhere that I need to be or ignore that i'm just going to go for high value stuff and the fact that decision point is different each time depending on what everyone else is doing and also the last bit of sort of genes and desire is the fact that the value of the regions is randomized every time exactly yeah so those chains are different every time you can't fall into a pattern you have to react to what other people are doing and what chains will work and what which ones won't it's yeah it's fantastic i've, I've played it loads and i think i've won it once <laughs> I always have this this fantastic picture where I sit there and, and kind of in, as we're coming into the last few turns I work ahead and I'm like okay well that's going to allow me to reinforce into there and that will do that one and, and then there's just one area that I've missed <laughs> that I haven't accounted for where somebody else can reinforce and the whole thing falls apart <laughs> <laughs> it is a fabulous game that if we can mention Rumble Nation on every episode and tell everyone how great it is I'll do it it's fine now Rumble Nation, easy to grok, clean, quick playing. Everyone plays it and immediately goes and gets it. And we're going to break all that I down. I see where this is going. All over, all of them. <laughs> we're going to flip over. Star Trek Ascendancy. Yes. <sighs> I can't get my head around this game. I don't, I, I've been struggling to put together coherent thoughts on it. It's 2016. It was from Gale Force 9. Like many of their games, it has conflicting parts to it. It has greatness and not so great in the same box. Aaron Dill, John Kowaleski and Sean Swaggart. In Star Trek Ascendancy, each player is running one of the factions within the Star Trek universe. And they begin on a home planet with a few ships and they have the ability to spread out over a board which is not set yet. It's not a board, it's just a playing area which will be formed from lanes of various lengths and then systems which may or may not be planets. And each player is spreading out from their corner of where they start looking to discover more areas, develop production and in whichever way their faction does it, score culture points. And it's the race to five culture points. And if you're the Klingons, as you might expect, you'll get them for killing people. If you're the Ferengi, Adam, you'll get them for oh, trading. <laughs> if you're the Federation, you can kind of get them in lots of different ways. So as you can imagine, each one has got their own driver. You've got your own technologies, which you can develop, which means that your ships or your planets work in slightly different ways to all the other players. You've got interaction with the other players, which can be friendly or non-friendly. There will inevitably be battles at some point breaking out because one player will be ahead at least of the other players and we'll have to start trying to do something to stop that player. But it's a race to only five points. So it's a lot of build-up and then the big climax and then someone eventually wins and their name is not Ronan. <laughs> or Adam. <laughs> Let's start with a the theme because uh, I, I, I may or may not have had the right impression here. You quite like Star Trek. I do. It's it's an interesting one that I've I've never considered myself to be a Star Trek fan. And then I think when we were setting up this and talking about it, we discovered that I was the only one who's seen basically everything. <laughs> sort of, pretty much You've all seen of the series. Everything. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say everything. Discovery. I, I couldn't get through more than a couple of series of Discovery. I did stick it out through the second series of Picard. So I don't. Know, I mean, that probably makes me a super fan. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you something. <laughs> Saying it doesn't make you. <laughs> yeah, I um, I've watched all of DS Nine through twice. That would definitely be my my highlight of all Star Trek. That's, I mean, honestly, mine too. DS Nine is is my favourite series and probably influenced my choice of the Ferengi as a faction. <laughs> It was most I didn't I didn't see you as a Ferengi, but <laughs> the, in terms of the theme, Star Trek has its own feel, which does feel slightly different to most other sci-fi. Slightly less, well, it depends. Because they've done so many now, I was about to say slightly less conflict-based, slightly more story-driven, narrative-driven. That's not exactly what they've gone for here. No, there were certainly other ways to go, but if you couldn't hold your own in a conflict, you're probably not going to achieve anything else that you're looking to do. 
particularly as the, the Klingons were in there, even the Romulans to an extent, were very conflict-based factions. If they want to attack you, you have to be able to defend yourself, otherwise that's it. And those conflicts, pacing and the build-up, what you do early obviously drives a lot of what happens later on because there's a very slow starting pace to the game whereby in fact for, for a fair amount of the game you can just play it all simultaneously because there's no contact. As soon as there's a possibility of being next to each other and being in contact with each other then everything goes non-simultaneous but actually not a lot happens for a long time because in attempting to do anything you risk losing some stuff yourself and in a game where there's three or four but five factions would be a lot but usually three or four factions if Adam and I run into each other and we have a little bit of a fight and okay I might get something out of it but I'm knocked backwards and he's definitely knocked backwards let's say he lost then whoever the third player is is just laughing about that just hypothetically speaking I mean you know maybe <laughs> I don't know what if you're going to shoot one ship deliberately all the way over to the Romulan <laughs> side of the board early on I mean, I, I think we have covered that as, as much as we need to. <laughs> <laughs> Adam got caught with a random event which plopped him right in the middle of the Romulan Empire very, very early on as the non-combative Ferengi. <laughs> but oddly, oddly worked out for me. So I went for the Ferengi because I really liked the idea of doing something that wasn't combat-based, that was much more about trade, and, and so it seemed thematically that's what they would be doing. And actually what they do is they benefit by having ships in orbit around somebody else and the other person can benefit as well. Being able to, to kind of create these mutual situations. And so what happened was my ship got flung across the galaxy and, and dropped onto one of Lloyd's planets. But it meant that I was no threat to him. And so actually we could just do that mutual benefit thing. So that kind of worked out okay. I think what didn't was me pushing into your territory and saying, hey, it's all right, I'm no threat, don't worry about it. But perhaps rather rudely... <laughs> just stomping in with a with a fleet and and you didn't take too kindly to that which no. then absolutely meant we both exert you know put resources into fighting each other for a little bit and definitely put us behind the curve oh i was behind the curve anyway i'm just terrible at the game <laughs> it, because in, in terms of combat it's, it's rolling dice but you can mitigate all the rolls of the dice you can spend your resources to make it yourself either more defensive make your shields more effective or make your weapons more effective or again these technology upgrades so many of them though seem to be driven towards there's going to be a conflict in this game yeah so being the Ferengi felt particularly difficult for me because you were trying to do it non-combative where everyone is kind of on edge it's like this is a high stress situation. Don't, you know, your, your ship can stay there next to all of my ships. Don't come anywhere like, as long as I can kill you at all times, which doesn't really work for trade. They were a, a very difficult faction to play, and I'm sure there are strategies because obviously I've only played it the once. It was my very first time. I'm sure that there are strategies that you could find with the Ferengi of maybe spreading out, giving everybody some benefit, and then quickly building up shields so that when people do turn on you, you you've actually got some staying power. Because essentially, in, in those early turns, everybody else needs to let you gain points. And so you're kind of getting resources that allow you to just buy victory points effectively. Because you can't score victory points the normal way, can you, as Ferengi? You, ha you can only buy them. No, it's only by buying them, essentially. I it's a form of asymmetry within this game that's different to the more obvious ones of a Hoy route, the kind of newer style, if you like. This is more faction-based. That is actually one of the most asymmetric things about it, from the initial one, is, is the way the Ferengi get points. Yeah. Other civilizations, other factions were nudged towards doing certain things to score points but a lot of it depended upon getting your technology built and I didn't feel like there was the ability to get enough technology built I feel like it was a game of there's potential here where I can do all these interesting things you can do all those interesting things and we'll make decisions about how to use our powers but did anyone get more than two or three technologies built which means we didn't really get very different to each other or certainly not as different as I was hoping for to give it a bit more flavour yeah, I think I, I focused on the technologies because I had some things that comboed nicely. I sort of got benefits each time I built new technologies. So I think I got four or five, but I was doing a very different thing to you. So it wasn't apparent that this had, had sent me in a different direction and given me different powers to you because I, I, I just wasn't competing directly with what you were doing. So that made it feel like it was more a race game for me that I was mm. just trying to quickly do the thing I was doing before somebody else, uh, which was Ed, wasn't it? Who was the Klingons? 
Yeah, Ed was the Klingons and he was a problem. He was a big problem. <laughs> so before he could just smash into somebody else's empire and get all his points for, for killing people, essentially. It felt a bit like a, one of the most boring stages in, in a cycling race where everyone meandered along, meandered and meandered along. We got to the last 10 kilometres and suddenly everyone started sprinting. Yeah, definitely. Did you get a feeling of diplomacy and politics and there'd be sort of a, a level going on above everything where there's the ability to persuade people around you to do things that would benefit you and not others? I think I got a small degree of that because of the faction. And I think I definitely got the sense that actually I should have engaged in that. The the thing I mentioned earlier where I did just, you know, kind of meander into your sector and be like, that'll be all right, won't it? It's fine, I'm not a threat. <laughs> actually, in hindsight, we should have just discussed that. There were mutual benefits. You probably would have been okay with it as long as it didn't seem threatening. So that did really give me that that feeling of the diplomacy of it. I think, again, it's really faction-dependent. There was no diplomacy with the Klingons because they were 100% incentivized to just come and kill everybody. Yeah. But didn't actually go, in order to score those points to win, didn't actually get very far. It's not like they rampaged through people's systems and stuff. It was like they won a couple of battles against Lloyd and then, as a last-ditch thing, I threw myself against them trying to slow them down, which didn't work because I realised I'm throwing ships against the faction that scores points for killing ships. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or you build up defences and put them in their way and they yeah. come in and kill the ships because that's what they, they benefit from. The game mechanisms for diplomacy, which is really just those trade deals, mm. that I quite liked but felt like maybe slightly too much of an abstraction of it. Mm. But I suppose once you combine that with just table talk and the actual kind of player interactions, the game doesn't do it for you. You need the player interactions to make it work. That feels like a very Gale Force 9 thing whereby their games are intended to be played in a certain way. It's not always explicit within the rule book. And as a group, if you can click into, oh, this is what they want us to be doing, then it really starts to work. But it can take a few games to kind of work out, what do, what do they want me to do? How do I have to change my mindset? Where do I have to sort of bend my way around to follow the course they've laid out for me? If I follow that course, this game can be great. If I don't follow the course, it, they fall a bit flat. It just happens again and again with their games. I definitely got that sense from it. And I think there was an extent to which we were engaging with that and we were, were sort of trying to get a sense of how can you play it that isn't just I do my thing. I don't know that that's a, a huge failing in it as long as you know that going in. Yeah, it, it feels like a game that might benefit with your Stroud group where you get it out and you play it and then, OK, go away and have a think about it. I'm going to try something different this week and different, something different this week, something different this week. And then once we've all tried a few different things, we've all got our own thoughts because there's flexibility between what you do. I mean, there's still randomness in what planets come out and when you hit hazards early, it's much more punishing than hitting them later on. You can get sort of stalled early. But then those small things that almost, because there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of components, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of technologies, the small things that actually make a difference sometimes can get lost in the noise. Whereby actually someone getting slowed down there and them losing their first three out of their first five ships. Right, now they're now less of a threat. And in fact, if I want them to look after that person for me, I might need to help them a bit and get them up and going. And you, you get used to those subtleties. Yeah. Seeing the meta game that obviously we all started building away from the Klingons mm. and just said, well, we just don't want to be near them. Which meant that when they were then able to establish corridors, there wasn't a kind of concerted defence against them. And maybe if we were to play that again, the other three of us might say, you know what, we need to work together and trade with each other, build something up, get, get some defences in place that aren't as easy for them to just smash straight through. I feel like almost everything I said was quite negative. But what I also need to say is, I really enjoyed it. I had a really good time playing it. It was, it was. A, I don't know how good a game experience it was, but it was a really good experience. I, I had fun, and and you know, part of that was just it was in good company, and and we all kind of engaged with it enough, and kind of like not role played it as such, but had a sense of our faction, and were doing that thing, and there was some some good kind of table talk. It was really enjoyable. It's hefty. Mm. It was, you know, I think probably by the time, if you include kind of setup and breakdown and rules, four hours maybe? Getting on there, yeah, for sure. It was a, a significant chunk of time, and so you've got to be prepared for that. But I think if you have a group who are going to get into the theme, if you have a group who you're happy spending four hours with just kind of figuring something out, I think I'd probably play it again. Not great praise, but we'll take it. We'll take what we can get. <laughs> you know. I mean, I've been pushing it. I've bought factions for it because I felt like 
just playing with the first factions that come in the box was a bit flat. They were a bit obvious. Like the Ferengi is an expansion faction. I've also got the Borg expansion, which means that there's a chance all the time of the Borg appearing in the middle. And, and now we've got to deal and with this. Like we've got to, and they might even head off in just one direction. And then it's up to the others to support that faction. Because if that faction gets taken over, we all lose. So that could be interesting as well. But I really want us to sort of understand the game itself better before we add more bits in because i feel like there's a lot of growth for us to be more aware i do wish it was not longer (laughs) i wish that maybe we started with more production so that we were doing more interesting things now this is you met you mess with a star trek ip at your peril because this is a game that's now seven years old the support for it seems to have slowed down like in terms of what Gale Force 9 are printed for it and stuff like that so there's something to be aware of if you're going to be right on the bleeding edge of what's going on Star Trek Ascendancy because you can use the actual rulebook but there's also the combined unofficial rulebook or the unofficial complete rulebook and there right. are uh, there are factions within factions of how you should play Star Trek Ascendancy nowadays <laughs> and what's quite interesting is the combined unofficial rulebook is the rules Gale Force 9 have put out but cleaned up with some inconsistencies and to make things work slightly better and take away some of the rough edges but there's a whole other group of people they were doing that through three or four versions to have a decent ongoing comprehensive rulebook have split off and made the unofficial complete rulebook which takes the idea of the game the components of the game everything's in it, and then has written a different rule set for it all <laughs> <laughs> and that's what sort of the hardcore are playing is a completely different game and I'm quite intrigued what that game is I think that is a bridge too far for me <laughs> um, you know kind of cleaning up the rules fixing some errors fine but I, I think that's that's when you're getting into lifestyle gaming I'm, I, mean, I don't want to write the book but I am quite intrigued to see what they did with it because I, I, to me it is a game more of potential than delivery to this stage like four games into it so yeah. anyway I thought that was interesting enough I was laughing reading that for, for no reason Red Cathedral Adam yes tell me your history of Red Cathedral Red Cathedral I, I've heard somebody on a podcast banging on about for years not sure who that was but had never really had the opportunity to play it and then again one of the Stroud groups somebody had a copy we, we've sort of played it quite a few times and when he was coming to sell his copy as I'm now doing all too often I jumped in and said oh brilliant I'll buy it and then we can carry on playing it So I now have a copy of it. I enjoy it. Again, it's dice. And also another favourite mechanic of mine is the rondel. So a dice-based rondel system for action selection. Love it. Can't get enough of that. The area control side of it, the, the, the actual claiming of the cathedrals, I think the more I play it, the more I think I don't love that as much. I almost wish there was all the rest of the game and it was actually contributing to something else. But yeah, at this point, I think I've, I've probably played it maybe half a dozen times, and then obviously played it once with the expansion. Indeed, which is what we're here to talk about. So you and I, I see, I always think we've got different ideas about games, and here we are agreeing all the way through this episode. <laughs> I thought there'd be more <laughs> rowing. But um, Well, that's because you chose the games, and I'm generally agreeable if I'd picked <laughs> the games in a different matter. <laughs> I chose the games we had played together. <laughs> yeah. You did leave a whole city in order to avoid me. There wasn't that big a selection <laughs> <laughs> so we did play Red Cathedral Contractors together expansion from Devere Games what Contractors brings to the base game of Red Cathedral is a Grand Duchy of Moscow board in which there are cities and each of the towers that we're adding to as Adam's talked about to score points in Red Cathedral is going to be linked to one of the cities on the Grand Duchy of Moscow board and also there's a player board extension in which players are going to get contractors and they're going to be able to collect permits. And there's now a fourth basic action within the game and that is to send contractors by spending permits that you've collected to hire specialists on the Moscow board. And the specialists are basically one-use tiles that let you do stuff. And the stuff is just a boost onto the normal things you do, where it be to get more resources or to just slightly twist up the basic actions within the game. And it's to provide you with an edge. You can have one at a time, and at the appropriate time, you use it to add on to your current action and kind of kick yourself on a little bit. Now, when the tower that is linked to a city space scores, 
you're also going to close down the city on the Grand Duchy board and that city is going to score some points for the people who are present there with contractors and the number of banners you have in the tower times the number of contractors in the city linked to that tower is the number of points you're going to score so it gives you a consideration of where you're putting your banners where you're taking specialists from and in order to get a few extra points for having married those two up that's sort of the main part of, of the expansion Adam as well as that there's a bunch of extra guilds which I'm going to get into and go through a few of them in a little while I know you've only seen one of them yeah. I'll talk for you a few more of the others that major extension and, and the addition of the contract and special system what were your thoughts on it didn't like it mic drop you know when you play an expansion for the first time if it's a game you know quite well you want to explore the expansion and, and really kind of engage with those new mechanisms and so I really did think okay well Here's a tower that's that's attached to one and, and is one of the taller towers. So I'll kind of focus my energies on that tower and that city and try and marry those things up and try and get the benefits from being in, in the city. But it really felt like it was a lot of effort. There were a lot of steps to go through, all of which not distract from, because obviously if you're getting a lot of involvement in a tower you're probably going to score points from that tower as well. So you're doing other things. It's, it's not that you're totally giving things up to do that, but I was having to do things in a less efficient way in order to try and get that combo at the end. And when I did, ultimately, it was worth next to nothing. <laughs> not worth the opportunities that I had given up in order to do it. Maybe I just didn't play it very well. Obviously, that's that's a, an ever-present possibility for me. But I didn't feel incentivized to engage with that expansion mechanic. And if we were to play again with that, that element of the expansion, I think I'd probably steer away from it and hopefully just earn more points by doing base game stuff. All in all, I didn't find that it added to the experience of the game. It just added complexity in the area that I didn't feel needed more complexity. You've spoken for me. That's well, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Red Cathedral is an efficiency race and it's best when there's pressure on and the points are limited and everything you're doing is focused on oh this one more banner is going to change all that out it was just distraction it was just noise that like you say in the end ended up to be just fluff when you got to it it was just there's nothing really there the specialists weren't that exciting you got a few bonus points from different colours of specialists but even that was sort of if the right colours weren't coming out where you were trying to build up the scoring for the Tower City combo it's like well what my god! Which one of these? Um, we're all going to score twelve points out of this. Yeah, somehow we're all going to do it a, a bit, kind of as much as we can, given how difficult it is to get in there. And then ultimately, it's not going to swing the points that From much. Chasing permits. I'm I'm not being very efficient on my little bar of things. Red Cathedral makes me feel like I'm being a little bit clever when I manage my resources and I'm getting exactly the resources I need at the right time and keeping it very tight. Anything that loosens that off to me takes away that feeling of no I'm I'm doing something really well and efficiently in here and I'm manipulating the dice and I'm and I'm thinking slightly ahead and it was yeah, not for me at all, at all. I, I thought this was finally going to be my controversial opinion but no. No, it, it, <laughs> no, absolutely no. agree so okay we're, we're lockstep again with that don't worry the next game we're going to disagree on I'm sure of it <laughs> right <laughs> the other part of, of the expansion is you get extra guilds you and I played with the jewellers and what the jewellers do is they give you access to diamonds so they it always replaces these the sort of uh, religious area on the board of the guild so instead of that for handing in money for points that's gone and you replace it with, with one of these guilds some of them are linked to the expansion which i'm not actually going to go over because i didn't like the expansion so i don't think yeah, if, they, if they get you an extra special whatever i don't care but the jewelers that we play with gave you diamonds you had to hand stuff in to get them but then they became wild resources so what were your thoughts on that because that actually loose we're just saying it's an efficiency puzzle that loosened it up a little bit it does go slightly against that notion of the really tight efficiency game, but I think it did remove some of the potential frustration that every now and then you get at a point where you think there's there's a couple of things that I really need and it's just never quite falling out with the dice that I can I can land on that. And it does at least give you that one more opportunity. And there's a cost and obviously you have to trade in resources. It's I think it's a, a sort of two to one rate. But at least it means if you're looking around the board and you think I just can't hit the thing I need Unless the thing you need is also where you get diamonds from, then it, it gives you that, <laughs> which, which would really suck. But it, it gives you that one more opportunity to think, okay, great, if I if I do play it slightly differently, I get in there, I get some diamonds, that then allows me to progress. So 
I don't know that the game needs it, but certainly I, I thought it was a an interesting addition and, and certainly not a negative one. No, I, I agree with that as well. It's, it's sort of a half turn of a screw of a loosening of it, possibly well suited for even newer players because you can get blocked out of green or purple so you can't do your decorations quite as efficiently. Uh, I like the jewellers. The bad news was that they're probably the best kill. <laughs> 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 There's um, artisans which will aid pay stuff in to either activate your own workshop tiles or other people's workshop tiles, which, eh, it's okay. There's a foreman one where there's actually a foreman figure who moves around the towers, and where they stop, you get points or rubles, and depend upon which foreman action it is, either for your own banners or someone else's banners within the towers, which is it doesn't really feel linked very much, very well to the rest of the game. It's, it's okay. There's managers that basically is just letting you get or swap resources for points or rubles it's just like another transaction thing that wasn't terribly exciting and there's archivists which should be interesting because the cards that you can get you have to pay for them you give you a maximum of a three at the end of the game and they give you some end game scoring and i'm like oh okay okay that's that's quite interesting it's like handing two stone for two points or yeah. have three banners in the same tower for three points and stuff like that it's it's not inherently interesting the core system is so good they didn't want to mess with it too much they didn't take very brave design decision with these guilds because they, they're like well that will throw all the maths out so I don't want to do it but then in fairness with the city they did mess with stuff and we didn't like it so that's true maybe they could never win <laughs> it's not a great expansion can't say it's one that I'm very happy that I've got no I think really the, the message is if you already own Red Cathedral go and play it again it's great correct but you don't need any more and use the money to buy Rumble Nation Exactly. Or maybe or, use the money to buy sea salt and paper. And probably have enough left over for a pint. <laughs> Not <laughs> if you've got to import it from France like I had to. There's none left in the country till May, I'm told. Again? Uh-huh. I've got the second wave of it. Okay. It's from <laughs> Bombix, designed by Bruno Catala and Theo Riviere. I, I'm trying to think of what subgenre to put it in, but Ad- Adam Game is just the one that just screams in my <laughs> ear every time. It is a set collection game in which you're going to be drafting either from the top of the deck or from one of two discard piles. The cards have got colours to them, which may or may not score for you, depending. Some of them are just pure set collection. Some of them will enhance sets that you've collected and some will give you actions if you collect pairs of them, which will score your point for collecting a pair, but also if you've got the crabs let you take a card from the top of the deck. Uh, No, crabs you can search through the discards. There you go. Fish is top of the deck. Boats is take another turn. And swimmer and shark Shark is grab one from someone's hand. Yeah. Right, so they give you other ways in which to get cards and and try and create these sets. Now, the whole twist on it, Adam, and you like a twist in a card game. I love a twist. I know this is that there's a different ways of finishing the round, and I think I'll let you take over there. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. Um, what, what the least tricky bit of the rules? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so you can, and notably in the second edition, there's a little reference that tells you how it works which I don't think there was in the first. You can choose to end the round once you have at least seven points, and that's on cards that you've got in hand and those pairs that you've played to the table. They all just score together. So if you have at least seven points, you've got two choices. You can simply say, stop. You've played your final turn, and everybody just scores the points for what they've got, what they've acquired over the course of that turn. If you're confident that you're a decent way ahead you can instead say last chance and then everybody else gets to take one more turn and at the end of that you all compare your scores. If anybody has a higher score than your score then everybody else scores their score and their longest colour suit and you only score your colour suit but if they don't, if you're still ahead you get your score plus your colour suit and everybody else just gets their colour suit. It's as simple as that. I, I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. Everyone who followed that may now go and eat a biscuit. Well done, you've earned a reward. Anyone who's played the game and in the first round, because it's several rounds, you're trying to, depending on the player count, get to a certain number of points. Once anyone's got that number of points at the end of a round, then whoever scored most points wins. After the first round, anyone who's playing it has got that rule. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no. We'll go over this rule again, shall we? And like you say, at least there's a player rate. Okay. 
So you told me it was the origami game. That's all I knew when I ordered it. And it came and it wasn't an origami game. So for starters, that got me annoyed with it. <laughs> There's no actual origami to the game. It's, it's just a... Well, so Call a game an origami game, Adam. You say, Ronan, have you got that origami game? And I say, no, an origami game. Amazing. Oh, can I get it from France? That's fine. I'll pay £10 postage. I want to play an origami game. So when you bought War of the Rings, did you did you expect there to be a sword in there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very disappointed. And the actual Nazgul. Obviously, it's an abstract. It's an entirely abstract card game. But an origami game but- is possible. It, it would be possible, yeah. I mean, maybe only once through. But <laughs> but it, instead, what it is, is an abstract card game which has really, really lovely artwork, all of oh, which is based why we, on... No, why, hold on. Sea-themed origami. What? The, it looks like something from a 60s BBC kids show, the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Bagpuss. It's like one of the breaks in Bagpuss has come like, I can't believe you said that was nice artwork. <laughs> it's so different. It's unlike anything else. And if you, the ones with the, the ships kind of on the crest of a wave and the wave has all been origami. That's the coolest one. Those, yeah, yeah. And there's some, there's some interesting fish. There's an angler fish in there that you look at and you think, what the hell is that? Why have they put it against weird old fashioned studio backgrounds for photographies? It all adds to the charm. Adds to something. Okay, okay, we'll disagree about the artwork. But I've presumed without ever asking you that you enjoy the game. Oh no, I, I hate it. No, I do. I really enjoy it. It's it's another one of those that as soon as I played it, I immediately said I have to get a copy of this. I think I ordered it in November and it arrived in March because I had to wait for the reprint. I think when you say it's an Adam game, I don't know that it quite fits into that category of... You know, things like Colchetic and, and, you know, like Race for the Galaxy, that kind of thing, where, where it's kind of multi-use, where there's a lot of complexity th- to it, where particularly in the Chudic games, there's a lot of complexity in how the cards interact. It's not that. In some ways, it's almost closer to a traditional game. It's almost closer to, like, Jin Rumi or something, but just with enough interesting twists on it, the different ways that things score, the choices in how you gain the cards. So if you're top-decking then you get slightly more choice, but also it's hidden. Whereas if you're taking from the discard piles, everybody knows what you've got, so it's slightly more chance for people to track what you're building in order to then help make that decision when it comes to the end and comes to whether you go stop or last chance. I think it just has a lot of small things that add up and combine really well. It is a filler in terms of complexity and in terms of length. It's on the longer side of a filler if you play the full game. It's an hour, maybe a little bit more if you're if you're actually playing to the full kind of points. So, so an hour is definitely not a filler. <laughs> so it's a it's a super filler. It's an hour long game. But you can just play a single hand, which would be so random if you just played one hand, because <laughs> each hand within itself is so random. How well you do. I don't know that I agree. I I mean, yes, there are ways that you could randomly do well or do badly, but there's also the more likely outcome is somewhere in the middle where actually the choices that you make of what you're discarding where and, and where you're picking things up from is going to have more of an impact on your success than just the look of the draw. Have you played it more two, three or four players? I've played it quite a lot as a two-player. I think basically two and three. I've not played it a lot with four just by chance, it just hasn't come up. But I have heard that it's not as good with four. I'd say it's pretty awful with four. Right. Because then when a player puts a card down and anyone has any clue that you want it, there's two people that can take it before you get it. And it's very rare that the top of the discard piles are actually useful to you by anything other than by chance, basically. People get so few cards before the seven's called that they're just taking everything. They're taking everything from the discard piles and you end up just looking at like, oh, there's a, there's two swimmers in that deck. I know there's two swimmers. No one wants a swimmer. Clearly no one's got a shark in their hand. So there's a lot of top decking going on. I knew that that decision of when to finish would be much more interesting to you than it is to me because are you actually following the other players closely and working out whether it's the right time to do it and whether calling stop or call that last chance thing, do you actually have a strong idea that what you're making is an informed decision? Definitely in a two-player game. Mm. I think more so in a two-player game, but certainly to an extent in three. I mean, obviously it means you've got twice as much to track. Where people have been taken from the discard piles, even where people have been doing the the shark and swimmer to steal from you, 
and it's it's random what they steal, but at least you know what they took, and and you can get a sense of of what they might be able to put together. That can be really painful. It can when it breaks up a thing that was really working for you. And so I've I've played it with my wife a few times recently, Selena, who is she's not like a she's not a gamer like we are. Certainly, there are some games that she's she's happy to play, and she really enjoyed it. She was very taken by the art because it's lovely art. <laughs> But, you know, she she did sort of say, if we were to play it again, I think maybe without the shark and swimmer, because it can be a bit too punishing when you've really built something up and you, you're thinking, oh, this is great, and then just by the look of what gets taken out of your hand, it's all torn down. Because hand sizes can be pretty small Yeah. by the time stop gets caught, especially if you're playing pairs out, you can end up with three or four cards, and if they work together, one getting pulled out is, yeah... Yeah, so that's a bit more for your heavier gamers who are going to enjoy the threat of it, I guess, the, the risk of it, because that's another thing that you're having to take into account when you're when you're calling the ending, because you might think, I just want to push it, I want to get a little bit further to be sure that I'm ahead, but I see, you know, there's a shark on the discard pile that I can't do anything about, maybe somebody's going to grab that, maybe now's the time to, to just call stop. So I, I do think that there's a decision space there. I think you might be right about four players. When it's going poorly, because some hands just start off and you start collecting and, and just things aren't coming up in the discard piles for you and you end up with five cards and none of them match each other. Do you think there's anything you can do? Is is there a way you can go like, right, now I'm just going to chase colours and I'm going to try and manipulate it so that that will work for me or is it not? There's definitely a degree of strategy there in if you've got enough time of actually sort of pivoting or even going for it from the outset and thinking if I've got the colours that work together then if it is a, a last chance, then at least I'm actually going to score decently from the colours. And that's where the mermaids come in as well, which I think we didn't mention mm. in the in the sort of rules introduction, which is within the deck there are four mermaids, and they'll just score you for your longest suit. And if you've got multiple mermaids, they'll score for your longest and then your second longest and so on down. But they can be a way to actually build pretty significant points. There's also kind of a shoot the moon rule, which is if you ever have all four mermaids together, then you just win the game full stop. Which I think obviously is more in play with two or maybe three players. Four players, and you'd be very lucky to... You'd have to be very lucky. They're, they're, they're going to spread around more thinly because... Unless you draw two mermaids together or you draw one and just the perfect thing that you need for the set that you're building, you're going to keep them. So mm. they're less likely to turn up in the in the discard. But I have seen people do really well out of mermaids. I wonder if they should have been braver and just put this out as a two or three player game. Because I played two player and I was like, okay, there might be something here. I wasn't great at judging when to, when to call stop or final chance. Four player was on absolutely miserable experience for all four people played it with Rachel and Lloyd and Paul Arnell and <laughs> there was just abuse flying around the table <laughs> at me for having made the play it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I would need to play it more two or three player for it to have any chance of sticking around it didn't grab me two player so maybe it deserves another chance there but I, th- I think marketing as a four player game was a mistake in my experience from it yeah, and I think, I mean, we've been seeing more and more of that over recent years. Publishing companies, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed there wasn't a solo variant in it. I've read something about a solo variant. But, I mean, I'm sure somebody's got a good one. But, you know, the, the question, particularly anything kind of bigger box, is does it play one to six players? Yeah. Because that's yeah, all, yeah. it's, it's, it's got to be a broad range. And I think that does do a lot of games a disservice, where they really do shine at certain player counts and... Mm. and it would be in the interest of the publishers to to just market them at that. Agreed. So, have you got a final boost on uh, sea salt and papers to try and convince people it's decent? Well, I would say, you know, go out and buy it and play it. It's great, but apparently you can't buy it again. Not till so, May. Not in the UK. <laughs> not anyway. till May. If you like an interesting card game and you like interesting decision space, then absolutely play sea, sea salt and paper. If you're not keen on randomness in games, it's probably not for you because. <laughs> It is a card game, and it is a fishing card game, pardon the pun. It's where you're trying to put something together. You are going to be dependent on luck to some extent. So I think it's, it's got to be some for, for people who, who like a card game, really. It's only, it is only £10 once it's available. I would try before you buy, because it's going to suit certain people and not others. OK, we're going to finish off with a game which does work best at higher player counts. It is a sequel. It is Oriflam Ablaze from Studio H. And Adrian and Axel Hesling. 
the original Oriflam, we chatted about it on here. We played it at an aircon or two. Ellen is a big fan of it. It's a game in which you're taking stands around the table to lay a card and you add it to either end of a row. And at the end of the round, from left to right, those cards are going to get turned over and they're going to have certain actions. And they're Game of Thrones esque characters that interact either spatially with cards around them or don't but will score you more points or you want to leave them face down because you don't have to turn them up at the end of a round you can leave it face down and might accrue points either as a trap or as a way to score more points when you turn it over and people are trying to judge the cards that are in play what's most valuable what isn't using their attacks to take out cards that, that are scoring lots of points for their owners and at the end of the rounds basically having the most points everyone has the same deck of cards of 10 characters they take three out and they're choosing from seven and one of their cards will never get played what a blaze does it's the uh, it's the first sequel there's been a second sequel called alliance which mixes up yeah, slightly more but it's a very similar set of cards with slightly different powers so it plays in exactly the same way and in fact the two sets are interchangeable although there are certain rules and you need two of these four in and three of these six in in order to keep some sort of balance within there I do believe you have played both the original and I know you've played this one. What's your history with Oriflam, Adam? I think I'm pretty sure the original I probably played with you at some point and then had played it again slightly more recently, maybe maybe sort of six or nine months ago in Stroud and have always enjoyed it when I when I played it. It wasn't one that, that I kind of thought I'd, I have to rush out and get this, but I, I certainly liked it and I think early on was in my first game, I'm sure, was absolutely terrible at it. And it is a game that you can get better at and you can think a little bit more strategically. I like the hidden element of it. In both, I think there's some version of the trap. There's something, there's there's some card that's face down and when you attack it, something bad happens to you. But then that's a nice opportunity for a bluff that you can put a, a perfectly innocuous card and just let points build up on it. So I've always enjoyed it and then played a blaze with you. I think the same time we played a hoy. And then just recently, uh, a friend of mine here said, oh, I've accidentally bought two copies of A Blaze. Do you want to buy one of them off me? I was like, yeah, sure. So I played it again just last week. And yeah, I, I enjoy it. Again, it's one of those that, that is a filler weight. It is kind of at the sort of sweet spot with five. And once you're up to those kind of play accounts, it gets a little bit beyond filler length. I do sort of feel like the decisions that I'm making within it... I could kind of get behind it more if I were making those same decisions in a more condensed period of time, considering that you're only playing through seven cards. There's a degree of sort of theatre to it, so everybody plays their cards out each of the six rounds that you actually play, and then you work down the line and you activate and you figure out all the things that's happened. And that's enjoyable the first few times, and then later it's enjoyable if you've kind of worked things into a position where you've got interesting things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly in the last play, there was something right at the end where I was able to say, okay, great, well, I bribe that character there. They come over to my side. They kill, It was and it was the cutthroat, so they kill all of your guys who are about to start scoring points and score me a load of points. And, And when you get those little things that trigger and work, it's really satisfying and really enjoyable. But in my admittedly few plays of it, I think there's always been at least one or two turns for me where, and and for everybody, where you haven't got that. Where maybe you've just got one and it's a nice simple decision. It's like, okay, well, I turn over and I get some points for it. Or even the thing I was hoping, actually somebody else has had one of those brilliant turns. They've wiped all my stuff out and by the time it comes around, I'm not doing anything. I'm just kind of more of an observer. It's the style of game that, that tries to fill the gaming experience less mechanically and with the decisions and more I think with that idea with with the faux Game of Thrones theming of the intrigue and the politics around the table and the interaction and and keeping an eye on what everyone's doing part of the balance of it and there's a couple of scales in which I think the balance that they're treading a type wire here is is the mechanic interest enough for me to really care what cards I'm next to and what's likely to trigger off am I trying to read oh you've played that you've played that you might have that left it, like Citadel's kind of owned that down because we're all taking from the same hand which is one that I'd always go back and compare it to sort of one of my, my touchstones in this I think there's as much just chatting going on around the table as there is chatting about the game when I play it yeah I think it is less engaging and the sort of theatre Citadel's is a good comparison because Citadel's is a really good game to engage people because you are then somebody's kind of calling it and saying okay you know who's got the 
the thief, the witch, the, the whatever the the roles are, and and I think it tries to capture that. But like you say, it's only going to be interesting sometimes. Obviously, I enjoy it enough to have bought it, albeit secondhand. It's good that it plays up to five because not enough games do. Having you know complained about, we should be more specific. But, but <laughs> it's it's often a hard number to find something for. So I think to really play it seriously does require that greater degree of attention, that greater degree of, of commitment to it, to, as you say, sort of track what everybody's played and what they're likely to be playing and to try and work out traps and things. And I don't know that it's necessarily engaging enough to really lead to you kind of wanting to play it in that way very often or wanting to engage with it in that depth. It feels like the sense of being in danger compared to actually being in danger. It's kind of the best of these games. I want to feel like I'm actually being in danger. I said, oh, I might die, this might all fall apart and I'm a little bit stressed. With this, I'm getting the sense of being in danger. Oh, something might get killed. But actually, I don't really care when something gets killed because each individual little action doesn't make that much of a difference to me. And no, exactly. As the larger pattern unfolds, it's hard to predict the larger pattern because there's so many moving parts. So it's almost like I put a card out and then I see what happens. I can sit back and watch the murder on the stage rather than be hunted down with someone with a knife. And I think with a blaze particularly... It is very apparent that in almost every case, the decision is one or two points. It's, okay, maybe somebody kills my queen, and maybe they get a couple of points from it, and I don't score the two point. I've definitely seen, uh, in, and I think both games I played, somebody got hit by a trap, and then they were out. Right. There's no coming back from it. It's mm-hmm. such a huge swing. It might be if you play it enough that you see it kind of come around and you get more of a sense of how, they, how they're how they going to work and, and it might not be such a huge swing. But it felt disproportionate to, as you say, the smaller consequences of everything else. I think what they tried to do with the blaze is sort of mitigate that damage off, off the trap because they've tried to make more cards hang around for longer because in the original Oriflam. You could have, like, after four rounds, there could be three cards left in play. Yeah. They could bang, bang, I'll trigger off each other, and you're, in, you're almost resetting constantly. And they've tried to rebalance that dynamism to permanence by making things more permanent, but that makes a blaze feel even more gentle to me. And they've almost gone the other way, whereby trap is the only dynamic thing that happens. So you notice it even more in a blaze, whereas the idea is I think that you should have more just cards ticking over and you should be able to target more when you're putting down your kills what you might be able to hit. And again, this might be a personal thing where actually I prefer that where it's kicking off all over the place and things are going wrong and you're having to adjust to lots of things rather than this one. It's, it's a notch below the original for me because of that, because of that slight stodginess to it. I still think it's a good game. I'm still happy to get it out. And again, it's going to be one get after a game of Ascendancy. We're all a bit wrung out. Yeah, a little bit frazzled. Yeah, just like the attacks don't really feel like attacks. Let's just play Oriflam, chill out, have a chat. Oh, you got 12 points, I got 11. There we go. That's nice. <laughs> and then we can play something else again. It's a little bit of a gaming sorbet with the trappings of something more mean and meaningful but doesn't necessarily come all the way through i definitely see what you mean with the comparison when i sat down to play a blaze i was definitely thinking oh yeah it's, it's really chaotic and things kind of move back and forth and, and and whatever you put out at the beginning is dead by the end everything's getting kind of trashed and reset and so was then a little bit surprised with a blaze that, that like you say there is more permanence and i do think that if you're going to do this kind of re-implementation actually that's a good direction to go in and if you really liked Oriflam, but you had a group for whom it was too chaotic, actually you can go and play a Blaze with them, and mm. it's a bit more controlled, but you still, you know, you can go and play with the original. I just think with... it's funny, the more permanent one's the one that's called a Blaze. Well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> the third one's called Alliance, and it's not as entirely swap over as, as these two. Swap over, well, that's a new word. <laughs> as these two, interchangeable <laughs> as these two. You can't, I don't think you can mix the sets. And there is the ability to, to form very temporary alliances and these games are just intriguing enough that now that's on my radar that if it comes like you say if someone had a second copy or if I saw it at a bring and buy something like that it would be a case of oh yeah okay I do want to just see what they've what else they've done with it have they got it right the third time where they've honed this system down in something that really really works yeah it's definitely it's interesting enough that I mean perhaps I'd again if it were you know second hand or cheap Perhaps I would pick it up just out of, out of curiosity mm. to see how it works. That's the designer in you getting intrigued by little hooks. Yeah, well, definitely that. <laughs> That's what Seesaw and Paper did to you, I'm sure of it. You looked at that, there's two different ways of finishing a round and went, oh, 
Oh, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're done with everything we were going to cover. Have you got any further comments for these good people? I don't know that I have. This this feels... I, I don't even know if this is going to actually go out on the feed. It just feels like it's been too gentle. <laughs> and we just, we actually, just need to uh, disagree about something. We've been told off about the last episode 40 to 31 for uh, bickering, with, bickering with each other too much. Honestly, when it's you and Sean, that's what I listen to it for. <laughs> We're family. Of course we bicker. That's what families do. I think, but I'm not the only one's that interested, but because it was the second time recording it, it's hard to find something new to say. You can't just repeat the same thing because it would just be completely flat. Yeah. So sometimes the easiest thing to go to is just disagree. Not that we were, they were authentic thoughts, but sometimes some of the more negative things was coming out last episode. Because they were maybe the second thoughts that you'd... Yeah. You'd yeah, mentally edited yeah, exactly. out the first time round. There you go. Anyway, right. Adam, thank you so much for joining me this time. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the Game Pit Podcast. We're a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. You can catch us at thegamepitpodcast at gmail.com, head to twitter.com slash gamepitpodcast, and go to our guild, where currently I'm arguing about Zombicide with Sheepy, and he's wrong, having never played it. And his friend is definitely wrong. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, everyone. And we'll catch you next time on the Game Pit. Music by E. Aaron. Standing boy.